Hello everyone, and this is my review for TNA Slammiversary Pay-Per-View 2013's edition. Uh, I'll go off and just say, right from the get-go, I felt that the I felt the entire pay-per-view was kind of a mixed bag. They had some, uh, they had a down period in the in the pay-per-view where I felt it wasn't as good, and then they had some up, and then they definitely had some really good and really up periods in there. I'm gonna go ahead and start with the, the first match of the night, which was the X Division title match and the Ultimate X. Um, Starting out the show, honestly, I thought this was a very good match to start out the show with. The spots that they put put together with uh, Suicide, um, uh, Chris Sabin, and Kenny King were just uh, extremely well done. They did great spots throughout the entire match. Good to see that they decided to put the title on Chris Sabin, considering what he's been through with the knee injuries over the over the past couple years. All in all, the X Division title match, I felt was a very good start and a very good match to the to the actual pay-per-view itself. Uh, this eventually, after the match, this eventually brought out Hulk Hogan, which, you know, initially he was out there to uh, basically say, you know, uh, Chris Sabin will be able to have be able to turn in the X Division title for a world title shot at some point over the summer if he wishes, and then continued on to uh, do a promo afterwards with uh, being interrupted by Aces and Eights, which led to the six-man tag match. In all honesty, I don't know why they needed to use Hogan to set up the uh, six-man tag match at all. Just in the sense of, you know, it, it, the match was announced in uh, on Impact on Thursday, so it made uh, so having Hogan out there, you know, introducing Magnus and introducing Joe and then Jeff Hardy. You know, they tried to make it feel like it was an impromptu match when it was just uh, it was a match that was announced on the actual show beforehand. So it just felt a little weird and out of place in my mind in that in that sense. The match itself, um, honestly, was relatively sloppy. Uh, it. It was sloppy in certain senses, mainly towards the end with uh, with Jeff Hardy and Wes Briscoe doing the twist of fate and a few other things that Jeff Hardy was doing in there. Samoa Joe and Magnus, they did really good in the match with their spots. Same with uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Anderson and Garrett Bischoff. But uh, it just had some very sloppy moments and all in all it just didn't really come out as all that good of a match in my mind. It just didn't really seem to uh, resonate or make too much uh, sense with what they were going with before the match and then it wasn't all that great of a match to begin with so it, it just didn't really come off all that good. Um, after that was the gut, uh, was the gut check challenge match. The winner of that match goes into the Bound for Glory series. Um, it was an okay match between Sam Shaw and uh, Jay Bradley. Honestly, I felt that uh, it was a good choice going with Jay, uh, Jay Bradley there. I think he has a definite good look on him. Uh, he seems to work really well with a mic and has some decent in-ring skill there. So hopefully they will give him some good time during the Bound for Glory series to make him you know, a more over guy, a more over guy and see where they actually go with it. They haven't really had much luck with the gut check challenge people yet. This is their first real opportunity that they're going to go with a gut check person in anything major. So let's see where they're. So hopefully they do a really good job with uh, Jay Bradley in that sense. After that was, uh, it, after that you had the uh, backstage assault with, actually before the gut check match, you had the backstage assault with Joseph Park and, you know, Devon and uh, Knox uh, performed, you know, the backstage assault on him to basically take out Joseph Park. So you had Devon coming out there for the television title match. Of course, Joseph Park doesn't make it out there. Uh, you know, 10 count finish, uh, 10 count finish, forfeit match, all that kind of good stuff. Then he starts talking about Abyss. And then, of course, this brings out Abyss, who uh, basically comes in there and you basically had an impromptu match in that sense. Now, th this was the entire plan from the get-go to have it be Devon and Abyss. I really wish they would have just set it up to be Devon and Abyss to begin with. Uh, they should have left the whole Joseph Park thing out of it. Uh, because the way that it came off on the pay-per-view, you know, you already had the ma you already had the quote-unquote forfeit match, and then you have this impromptu match that wasn't even announced to be for the TV title. Then you have Abyss actually win the match, and then is now the television champion for uh, it's what seemed to be no reason whatsoever. The match itself was kind of just okay in general. It wasn't. Uh, really well done. Uh, it just didn't come off all that well to me on the on the t 
on TV in that sense. So, uh, all in all, that was pretty much those three matches in general, I felt was the main down point of the entire pay-per-view. Um, the first match was really good in my mind. I felt they started out really well, and then they had this little down section for about an hour where it didn't really seem to be all that great, uh, in, my, in my own personal opinion. Uh, after that, you had Dixie Carter make the announcement of who's the next TNA Hall of Fame person. They made the announcement that was Kurt Angle. Honestly, in the long haul, uh, Kurt Angle is not a bad choice there for the TNA Hall of Fame. He's done a lot for TNA Wrestling. He's done a lot in general for the company. So uh, I, I didn't think that was a bad choice. Uh, I didn't think that was a bad choice. Uh, but in all honesty, I feel for the actual company's Hall of Fame, they need to put Jeff Jarrett in there at some point in time. Uh, this should have been the year that they did it, and honestly, it should have been last year. Uh, he should, being the uh, co-founder or the founder in general of uh, TNA Impact Wrestling, uh, he should have been the first person into the Hall of Fame. Like I said, the two choices that they've made with Sting and, uh, the year before and this year with Kurt Angle are not bad choices, both well-deserved uh, for everything that they've done with their careers, not just in T uh, TNA, but in the other companies that they've been in as well. So, all in all, that was not a bad segment there. It was really nice to see the video package that they put together for Kurt Angle. Um, and they did a really well, uh, really good job of that. And this is where, and basically that, that announcement really picked up the show. And the last four matches, I felt, were really well, really well done in general. Uh, the the four corners, the four corners elimination tag team match was just a uh, really well done. Uh, it se it seemed like it was going to be a while before someone got eliminated, and then you had two quick eliminations out of nowhere with. Uh, with them getting rid of Christopher Daniels and Kazarian, and then the, and then getting rid of the tag champs, it was a nice little added touch to you know get rid of the tag champs before the actual finish of the match, or before the actual last fall of the match. There, it just gave that little uh, extra sense that okay, a title change is about to happen type deal, and. All in all, I felt that Gunner and James Storm they did a really good uh, they did a really good job being together. The last uh, fall of the match was really well done with Austin Aries, Bobby Roode, and James Storm and Gunner, and it was uh, good to see that. Of and it was also good to see that they decided to go with the James Storm Gunner route. And in this sense, just uh, just because you know you've had uh, Bobby Roode and Austin Aries actually you know hold the tag titles at some, at some point and everything, it was nice to see like a newer team go over in this sense and of course they, they'll have a, probably a potential feud with Austin Aries and Bobby Roode here in the near future over those tag tiles so we'll see where they actually go with that I felt that the match it was uh, really well done and it, it was a lot of fun to watch uh, the next match with Gail Kim and Tara Terrell uh, the last knockout Sandy honestly I will give I'll give them credit for this one they did a really good job with everything that they did with the spots that they were working with. Uh, they made it look really hard hitting. Um, all in all, it was a fun knockouts match to watch. I felt that the spots that they did were well timed, well placed, and uh, just extremely well done. Uh, good uh, good job by both uh, Gail Kim and Tara Terrell for putting on a, fu a fun last, man uh, last woman standing match in this sense. Uh, and uh, it was uh, really fun to watch in there. Uh, next was the Kurt Angle AJ Styles match. And again, uh, we've seen Kurt Angle and AJ in the past, and they put on phenomenal matches, great matches, and this was no different. I, I've, I said it in the past. I really like the way that uh, AJ Styles has used the whole new methodical type uh, uh, style to his matches instead of just being all high flying. I like that he mixed that methodical pace, somewhat submission type uh, wrestling. Uh, style in the match and then also using his high flying a little bit throughout the match as well. Um, the match between the two, two of them this time is just really great. Good timed out spots like I uh, like the counters with uh, the ankle lock and then the submission hole for AJ Styles in there. Um, uh, was really uh, you know was really well done and they did a really good job of countering each other's moves. I like the I just like the way they, they finished out the match. It wasn't uh, someone trying to knock someone else out or anything. It was just a, a quick roll, a quick roll up a good, and a good counter that finished out the match. So that was a really, really fun match to watch. 
so this leads us to the main event, which was Bully Ray's Sting world uh, world title, no holds barred, all that good, all that good stuff. All in all, for the most part of the match, uh, I think the booking of the match was tremendous. They did a really good job of setting up the match. Uh, Bully Ray's promo before the match, saying, "You know, I'm going for the pile driver," I'm go uh, and everything in that sense, with it being no holds barred and everything. Uh, it was really well done. Uh, seeing how they. Uh, and again, just the spots that they did uh, made it really look hard hitting and every, everything. I like the way that they uh, implicated the pile driver in there, not just but, not once, but they did it again. Also, I like the aspect of Bully Ray uh, actually cutting off the um, cutting off the ring apron to expose the uh, wooden planking uh, uh, under the ring. It just led to another like spot that made it feel like it was you know this was a hard hitting match this was a match that you know it meant something to the both of them and they did a really good job with all their spots in there the only problem i had with the match was actually the ending of the match where i felt they overbooked it with having the aces and eights uh people all coming in and it made sense for all of aces and eights to come out there and help bully ray you had multiple waves of them coming in there uh, my only problem with the match that made real no sense considering how they booked this whole Aces and A's versus TNA type deal. None of the TNA guys came out to uh, help, uh, come out to help, you know, Sting in that sense. And that was the only aspect of the match that I felt was poorly booked, was the aspect that it was pretty much Sting out there on his own. They would have been, a, uh, they could have uh, kept Bully Ray winning the match afterwards, but they could have, you know, added a, a little bit more to it with having the uh, TNA guys come out and help Sting. So for the most part, I felt that the uh, that the Slammer vs. pay-per-view was actually a really good pay-per-view. It had that one down period in the uh, after the first match, which was uh, with the X Division uh, with the X Division title. After that first match, and then leading up to the Kurt Angle announcement in the Hall of Fame, was basically the down period of the show. And I didn't think think it was really that good. I didn't think it was that well booked or even really made any sense in any way, shape, or form. But. Uh, <clears throat> But overall, I felt the pay-per-view was pretty good. And that last, those last four matches and the Kurt Angle announcement for the Hall of Fame just really picked up the show and made it, uh, you know, basically made it worth its while for you to watch in, in general. So uh, all in all, I felt the pay-per-view was, uh, was a good pay-per-view. And uh, yeah, that's my review for Slam Anniversaries uh, uh, for TNA Wrestling Slam Anniversary. Uh, I thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you haven't, if you haven't really uh, heard, I'm or if you haven't watched other, uh, a couple of the other videos, I am taking a hiatus from watching TNA Impact Wrestling. I won't be doing the reviews. I'm not saying I'm not going to come back to TNA Impact Wrestling at any point in time, uh, but I just feel like it's time for me to take a hiatus from it. And watching it, I really wanted to just uh, finish out these storylines. I felt they did a really good job of setting up the pay-per-view. And for the most part, they did a really good job on the pay-per-view itself. So, again, I thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And I do have other type of uh, wrestling reviews coming in the near future. It won't just be WWE. And uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy those as well. Thank you for watching.